morning, class. Thank you so much for being in church and being faithful this morning. Um, who does not have a handout? Raise your hand. Anybody got a handout? A few over here. All right. Brother Paul, good to see you. Sam, good to see you. Good morning. I want to let you know, class, that I've been praying for your prayer requests daily. And uh, I've found it a privilege to be able to pray. I've been praying for the Terrace Gardens. Amen. Irene. I've been praying for you, Brenda, and uh, your requests. I've been praying for William. And uh, I've been lifting them up before the Lord daily. I believe that's important. Mm -hmm. Last week I mentioned that if you want to show another brother or sister that you love them, pray for them. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's really important for us to be able to stand in the gap. For us to pray for each other. And uh, I love what the Lord said. He said, my house shall be a house of prayer. House of prayer. Well, let's jump into our uh, our lesson this morning. I'm excited to teach on the lesson of reverence. The lesson of reverence. You say, what does reverence mean? Well, reverence means to have a fear mingled with a high esteem and respect. Reverence. That's something that we should have towards the Lord. We shouldn't fear him and go and hide in our closet, you know, shivering and shaking from fear. No, we should have a reverential type of respect for the Lord. We should esteem him on high. We should elevate him far above anything else here on the earth. Amen. You say, why? Because he's worthy. Because he's worthy. So this morning, we're going to be teaching on a lesson on reverence. A lesson on reverence. Let me give you the introduction here. Uh, in your Bibles, if you will, turn with me to a few places, Matthew chapter 17, or it's on your outline there. We're going to read a few different uh, uh, Gospels about the Mount of Transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration. That's going to be our text for this morning. In Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9, we're going to take a look at Mark's account in Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, and then we'll take a look at the Gospel of Luke. From Luke's account in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. We're just going to take a look at the differences between the gospel writers there. The introduction here, the transfiguration of Christ was a monumental experience in the life of Peter. As Christ transfigured and appeared in his glory before Peter, James, and John. This lesson studies Peter's presence at the transfiguration and his response to the special moment. While many applications can be made from this story, perhaps the most important lesson learned from Peter is the importance of godly reverence. To reverence Christ is a key attribute of a committed follower of him. So the education of the disciple continues. Uh, Matthew chapter number 17, we'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll go ahead and read these uh, different accounts of Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke chapter 9. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to open our eyes on this beautiful new morning in San Diego. Father, thank you so very much for what happened over 2,000 years ago of you giving your life, you sacrificing your life willingly, joyfully on the cross. And Lord, as you were on the cross, I know that you had each and every one of us on your mind and on your heart. And Father, as you gave your life up willingly, we have now eternal life because of that, uh, because we put our faith and trust in you. Thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Thank you so much for your holy scriptures that we get to have the privilege of holding them in our hands and being able to study them and being able to see some of the things that happened with our uh, forefathers, our brothers and sisters in the days of old. Father, help us to learn from some of these things that we're getting ready to read this morning. We do know that your book is a spiritual book, and we do know that you told the woman at the well in John 4 that those who worship you must worship you in spirit and in deed. Father, open up our spiritual understanding as we open up the scriptures, and Father, thank you so much uh, for allowing us to be able to be here this morning. We love you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's look at Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 17. Verses 1 through 9, the Bible says this, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as a light. And behold, 
there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Uh, if thou will, let us make three, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while Peter yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. That's Matthew's account. Let's take a look at Mark's account in Mark 9, 1 through 9. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, and as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto him Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said, Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he was not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus, only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Now, Luke's account, let's read this. This is also on your outline here. This is a little bit of a different account here. And as it came to pass about in eight days, you notice that Matthew's account and Mark's account said six days. Luke's account says about in eight days. And after these things, he took Peter and James and John and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. So Luke is saying his, fa his countenance was altered. Uh, Mark and Luke said he was transfigured, which is basically the same thing. And his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You notice that's different than also Matthew's account and Mark's account. That's why I like reading all these different uh, uh, ways of how these gospel writers basically uh, pin these words down here. And the Bible says this in verse number 32 of Luke 9, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory, and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias, not knowing what he said, while he, yet, he thus spake. There came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. So you notice, the reason why I wanted to read all of these accounts is because Luke's account mentioned that Peter, James, and John were heavy with sleep, that they had been sleeping. Now, Matthew and Mark didn't mention that. Does that make one right and one wrong? No, it makes them all right. You say, so why is there a little bit of a difference? Why did... Luke's account say that it was about eight days. Why did Matthew's account and Mark's account say six days? Well, they're human. Amen. Yes, they were fully inspired with the Holy Spirit. But you notice what Luke mentioned here. He said, and it came to pass about in eight days. Now you have to think, for three and a half years, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the rest of the apostles, they spent three and a half years with Jesus. Now, the Bible says towards the end of John chapter 21 that Jesus did so many miracles and so many things that all the books in the world couldn't contain the things that he had done. 
But the Holy Spirit decided to pin these words down and to put these specific texts, if you will, in the scriptures for our understanding. Now, the way that I like to look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, is by basically how I mentioned it before about we're all traveling in a bus and we were to get into a car accident and the police officers were to come and take down our story of the things that we saw. Each and every one of us is going to have the main text. We got into a car accident. We got into a bus accident. Um, some of us might say, well, the, the color of the vehicle that hit us was red. Some might say, no, I believe it was brown. Some might say, no, it was blue. Does that make us wrong? No, it makes us all right. But the thing is, is we just, you know, we just saw things just a little bit differently, if you will, from a different angle, from a different perspective. That's why I like reading basically all the Gospels to see how all these Gospel writers saw things, how they pinned these things down. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they weren't with Jesus when he got transfigured. Who was with him? Peter, James, and John. Amen? So they had to have sat down when Jesus was resurrected with either Peter, James, or John and asked the story, hey, what happened? When you were on that mountain and Jesus got transfigured in all of his glory, what happened? And as they're listening to Peter, James, or John, as they're listening to the story, fully inspired with the Holy Spirit, they start writing down. And that's how we get the scriptures today. Amen? Let me give you number one on your outline here after the introduction, the Lord's program. The Lord's program. Often in the Gospels, Jesus invited his inner circle, disciples, Peter, James, and John, away from other men and demands of ministry to special opportunity that would enable them to focus specifically on Christ, on him. Luke's account mentions that they went up into the mountain for a specific purpose of praying. Matthew simply states that Jesus brought them up into a high mountain apart. From this example and others, we see that effective prayer time often involves separating oneself from the hustle and bustle of daily life and even from family and friends to spend a good quiet time with the Lord. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love praying standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Verse 6 says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which is seen in secret, shall reward thee openly. Amen. So what's Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, don't go out there to be seen of men. Uh, so that way people can say, oh, look at how religious and how holy that man or that woman is because they're praying. No, don't do that to receive any type of glory, to receive any type of praise from men. When you're going to pray, go apart, sanctify yourself, go to a quiet place and pray and spend time with your Father in heaven. That's number one, the Lord's program. Let me give you A, A, you're filling the blank, is the conference, the conference. In Matthew's account, in Matthew 17, 1 through 3, the Bible says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. While we don't know the precise mountain where the story takes place here, on what is referred to as a mount of transfiguration, the Lord, his, we do know that his face and his raiment were bright as the sun itself. He communed personally with Moses and Elijah. Throughout the New Testament, the scribes and Pharisees, gave the utmost reverence to the trio, Abraham being the patriarch, Moses, and Elijah. Peter was soon uh, to learn that Christ deserved reverence far above Abraham, Peter, Elijah, and Moses. The Lord deserved honor on a far higher level than even the patriarchs. What a privilege for Peter, James, and John and even Moses and Elijah, to enter this moment of communion with God. Amen? So you think about Jesus took Peter, James, and John to this mountain. He got transfigured before them. You say, why did he get transfigured before them? Why did 
Elijah and why did Moses appear unto him? Well, the Bible tells us, Luke tells us his account that Moses and Elijah were speaking about his coming death on how he was going to go to the cross, how he was going to glorify the Father, how he was going to redeem mankind back to himself. Remember that Moses represented what? The law. And Elijah represented what? The prophets. So remember that in the book of Genesis, that Moses, how we pinned down the first five books of the Bible, he had mentioned of the Messiah to come. Amen? He had mentioned the one that was going to bruise Satan's head. Remember that in, in Genesis chapter 3, I believe it's verse 15 or 16 in there. He had prophesied of that for the days to come. Now, the time that he was there, Moses and Elijah were there on the mountain they were in the presence of the Messiah. And Peter, as he, as he spoke out, not knowing what he was saying, said, Lord, it is good that we're here. Can we build three tabernacles, three dwelling places, if you will, for us just to take time and just to stay here for many days? But the Bible says he was not what to say. He was afraid. He didn't know what to say. Now, what Peter was doing is Peter was putting... Elijah and, Mo and Moses on the same level as Christ. Now, he was wrong for that. And, and I'm sad and I'm, and I'm sorry to tell you that these days, there's a lot of denominations out there that do the same thing. But I want to let you know, class, this morning, and you all know this, that there is none greater and none higher than our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's above all. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us in Philippians, he has a name far above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Um, let me give you this illustration. Uh, speaking about first class, if you will, privileges. On an airline flight, uh, the first class privileges don't come because of what your name is or what you've done. But because of the price that you paid for the ticket, Jesus has paid the price required for the privilege we enjoy of fellowshipping intimately with God. It's a privilege we should not take for granted. Amen. He has paid the price for us to have the privileges of being first class. Uh, let me give you this il other illustration. Uh, the king in Esther held out his golden scepter to Esther and invited her to come into his presence to ask for her petition. Even so, we have been invited into the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords all day long. Amen. In fact, the Bible tells us to come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Uh, let me give you B, you're filling the blank here, B, the cross, the cross. In Luke, Luke's account, in Luke 9, verse 30 and 31, the Bible says, And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. Can you imagine the conversation that they were having? Moses and Elijah with Jesus. Can you imagine? Maybe, maybe they were trying to strengthen him and encourage him. And, and him being God, of course he was human though. Remember the Bible says that Jesus hungered, he thirsted, he wept. Uh, you know, he, Jesus felt all the pain as he was on the cross. In fact, I believe this with all my heart, that as Jesus, before those other two thieves that were on the cross, Jesus died before them, I believe Jesus died of a broken heart. Yes, he did die because of, you know, how much they did punish him, the scourging, the whips, the mockery, the shame. But I believe this. I believe if you read Psalm 22, as the Bible uh prophesies about Jesus, I believe that he truly died of a broken heart. Amen. The cross. Imagine the conversation that Moses and Elijah had with Jesus about the cross. And the Bible, uh, and the, the, the text here, the notes say this, while the lives of Moses and Elijah were ones of significant impact, Peter would soon learn that the central event in all of history was to be the crucifixion and later, the resurrection of Christ at Jerusalem. In our last lesson, we saw Peter brought to understand forcefully that this had to occur no matter how he had felt personally. Remember, when Jesus took Jesus, when Peter took Jesus, and he began to rebuke him.
when Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be, uh, they're going to spit upon me and, and whip me and, and I'm going to go to the cross. And remember, Peter said, not so, Lord. And then what was Jesus' response to him? Get thee behind me, Satan, right? So Peter began to rebuke Jesus, not knowing that Jesus' whole purpose for being born of a virgin and coming down from heaven was to go to the cross and was to rise on the third day. Um, here we see the death of the Lord described as something he would accomplish. The word translated accomplish, according to the Strong's Concordance, means to fulfill or to carry through to the end. Interestingly and wonderfully, Jesus said these words from the cross, it is finished. Praise God, it is finished. Amen. Praise God, it is finished. The Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 through 14, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, watch this part, which can never take away sins. You know, if you think about this, I was born and raised a Catholic, and I remember going to a Catholic Mass, if you will, and the priests were there uh, in the confession booth. You know, they basically force you to come into the confession booth and confess your sins to the priest. If you don't do that, then all then you can't have your sins forgiven. You know, you have to go through the priest. You have to go through the bishop. You have to go through the hierarchy, if you will, in the Catholic Church in order for you to get your sins forgiven. You have to confess your sins to a man. But the Bible says this clearly, and I don't know why the, the Catholic leaders don't read these scriptures, and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But the Bible goes on and says, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering, what was that offering? Jesus giving his life. The blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary was shed. He had perfected forever them that are sanctified. What does that mean? We are sanctified. We have been perfected. We have been born again. We are sealed with God's Holy Spirit. That's all done because of the work of Christ, not because of how good we are, not of good works which we have done, not of works which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Amen. Let me give you Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7. I know this is a lot of Bible here. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth the son made of a woman made under the law. You know, it's funny that this verse here does not esteem Mary. Because the Catholics, going back to the Catholics, I didn't even know we are going to talk about the Catholics this morning. But uh, the Catholics would esteem Mary just like how Peter esteemed Moses and Elijah with Christ. They call her the queen of heaven, right? And, and this Bible verse here is very clear. When Paul was writing this epistle down to the church in Galatia, he was telling them, but when the fullness of the time was come, the perfect timing for God to send the forerunner, John the Baptist, to prepare the way of the Lord, and then he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, was the perfect timing. God sent forth his Son, made of a woman. doesn't say made of the Queen of Heaven, made of the Immaculate One. You know, the, the Catholics call her Immaculate. What does Immaculate mean? It means perfect and sinless. The last time I checked, that's only Jesus. He's the only sinless one, right? So this morning's message, what can we take from this morning's message? Not to esteem anything or anyone, even at the same level of Christ. We need to esteem Jesus far above anything else. Amen. And the Bible goes on to say, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, into your hearts. How? By crying out, Abba, Father. You remember that time when you got on your knees and you cried out, Abba, Father. Oh, Lord Jesus, save me of my sins. I believe I'm a sinner, Lord. 
please come into my heart and make me born again. I don't know how that was for, for some of you, but I remember for me, I, I was, uh, it was Y2K. It was 1999. Some of you remember that. Some of you might be too young to remember that. But uh, Y2K was the year 2000. We were in 1999 summertime. I'll try to give my testimony here quickly. 1999 summertime, my uncle had received Jesus into his heart about a year before, so he tried to witness to me. I grew up, I was uh, on the streets, I was smoking weed, I was a womanizer, I was a drunkard, you know, hanging out in the bars and in the clubs, and uh, fighting all the time, always angry with my parents, didn't have a good relationship with many people, uh, the, uh, I was dealing with anxiety and depression and fear. But uh, my uncle had shared the gospel with me in the summer of 1999. And uh, I remember as he was sharing the scriptures with me, talking about uh, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Yeah. He also took me over to the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 15, how it says, uh, if our name's not written in the book of yeah. life, we'll be cast into the lake of fire. Now, in front of him, I played this tough guy type of a facade. But inside, I was this little girl, if you will, I was crying on the inside. Now, I didn't receive Jesus into my heart at that specific time, but I didn't know, but my uncle planted seeds into my heart. Now, when I went home and I slept for many, many uh, weeks, I had sleepless nights just thinking, Carlo, if you were to die today, that you'd be in the pits of hell. You would spend eternity outside of the presence of God. Why? Because you're not born again, Carlo. Because you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus. Because you've been living a life uh, in fully in, in sin. But I remember uh, a couple months had gone by. And then we were getting uh, ready to celebrate New Year's, if you will. But all the media and all the news stations kept mentioning that all the computers were going to crash. Y2K. And, and some people were saying people's bank accounts were going to get wiped out. And missiles were going to get launched off. You say, why? why what, what, what's the deal with that? Well, with the computer system back then, we didn't have the technology we had today, but I guess the 1999 was going to flip over into 2000. So supposedly they were saying the computers are all going to crash. So the earth is going to end. You know, Armageddon is going to happen. So some of you might be laughing, but God used that time to put a fear in my heart and praise God for that fear. Why? Because I ha God has softened my heart. So I remember we were all at my grandma's house um, getting ready to count down, you know, the time for, for the end for what I was thinking. I remember just being in tears, Brother Gilbert. I was on my knees and I said, Lord, I said, please forgive me of my sins. Uh, up before that, the reason why I didn't accept Jesus into my heart when my uncle was talking to me is because I kept thinking, what are all my friends going to think? They're all going to make fun of me. You know, those are, those are the lies of Satan. What are all the girls going to think? And what are all the people going to think about me? I'm going to be a, uh, I'm going to be a Christian. You know, that's, that's kind of weird. And you're not going to be able to have fun anymore, Carlo. But listen, let me tell you, those are lies. If anyone in here this morning thinks that they can't have fun being a Christian, those are the lies from the pit of hell. Because I tell you, I have more fun now today than I've ever had in my entire life. And I thank God that at my grandma's house, right before... 2000, right before uh, we had entered midnight, I got on my knees with tears flowing. I said, God, I raised the white flag. Be merciful to me. Forgive me. I'm a sinner. I know if I were to die right now, I know I, I would go straight to hell. Please allow me to have a home in heaven with you. And I remember opening my eyes and, and it was 12 o'clock. And, and we're still here. I'm still alive. <laughs> Nothing happened. Praise God. And I remember I went home and slept. And the next day, I remember telling my mom, we were driving up 2nd Street in El Cajon. I said, Mom, everything looks so beautiful. Everything looks so different. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, to be a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I get a little emotional talking about my testimony. And I hope you do as well. I hope you embrace your testimony. Amen. But listen, the most important thing that we can take from this morning's lesson is let's not esteem people, let's not esteem Mary, let's not esteem the, the saints, let's not esteem anyone, even at the same level of Christ. Let's esteem Jesus far above anything else, amen? All right, let me give you number two here. Number two, the disciples' proposal. The disciples' proposal. I'm watching your time here. It must have been a breathtaking experience for the disciples 
to see the Son of God transfigured before their very eyes. The Word of God says His face was shining as the sun, and His raiment was, was as white as light or as the snow. Now, can you imagine that? For the disciples to see Him in all of His glory. Remember Moses, in the book of Exodus, told the Lord, Lord, show me thy glory. And what did the Lord tell him? He says, you can only see my back parts, right? You say, why? Because, listen, we're sinful people. And, and, and this is the reason on why we can't see God here physically, because he's super holy, because he's super pure, super perfect. If we were to see God, we'd be consumed, amen? We're sinful, we're flesh. Remember, the Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The only way that we could see God is if, is if he were to transform us somehow, some way into becoming spiritual. Because remember that God is a spirit, right? Uh, the Bible says this in Matthew 17, verse 2. And Jesus was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as light. Uh, Mark's account says and his raiment was becoming shiny, exceeding white as snow and as no fuller on earth can white them. Luke's account says, And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistering. The translation uh, of the Greek, I'm sorry, the transliteration of the Greek word here used for transfigured is metamorpho, metamorpho, from which we get our word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, what is that from? Remember how the uh, caterpillar turns into what? The butterfly, transfigured, if you will, uh, uh, translated, if you will. Uh, that's where we get that word from. Uh, we often use this word described as a transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. There was a complete change here in Christ in all of his glory. Uh, they had seen Jesus now. They had seen Jesus for many years. They spent time with him, seeing him as a normal man. But now they saw him in all of his glory. That's amazing. They saw him in all of his glory. Let me give you A, A on your outline, the tribute. The tribute. And I'm sorry, am I going a little too fast here? We're all good? All right. Praise the Lord. The tribute. The first thing Peter said was a wonderful response to a marvelous experience. It was properly stated and it was absolutely accurate. All three gospel accounts quote Peter as saying, Master, it is good for us to be here. Have you experienced situations in your life in which you could say it is good for us to be here? Do you truly appreciate what God is doing while it is happening? Or is it something you, you see only in hindsight? It is, a wise, it is a wise man who recognizes at the time when something special of a spiritual nature is going on. The Spirit of God may move in a church service, a camp service, a special meeting, between two individuals, yet often believers seem unaware of the significance of God working in that moment. One of God's greatest sorrows is that His own people have come to take Him for granted. We see this proof in the book of Malachi, where God chastens the priests for not giving Him proper honor, and also not proper honor unto His house and to His plan. They had long ago lost their sense of reverence for God, worship, and service had become simply a job and worse, a burden. Now listen, Christians, we can all become stagnant and we can all become like this, if you will. And that's really important on why we all need a revival. Because oftentimes what can happen is when we're serving, when we're ushering, when we're preaching, when we're teaching, when we're leading a, a children's class, whatever the work and whatever the case is, uh, we can all become stagnant, if you will. Amen. We can become robotical, mechanical, but we need to remember why we're doing it. We need to go back to the roots. We need to go back and say, I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm doing this to lift his name on high. Amen. I remember as my wife and I were driving here this morning that I, that I prayed that, Lord, help us not to forget why we're doing this. We're doing this for you, Lord. Yes, we're doing it because we love your people, but we're doing this because ultimately we love you. And listen, let me remind you, church, that we have a judgment seat that's coming up. We have a judgment seat that's coming up. And listen, our life, the works of our life are going to go through kind of sort of like a conveyor belt. 
and there's a fire at the end of the conveyor belt. And listen, only the things that were done for Christ are going to come out of that fire. The materialistic things, the possessions, whatever we're holding on to tightly here, the temporal things are all going to burn up. And only the things that we do for Jesus Christ will last. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we want Jesus to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want him to give us crowns, if you will. How do we get crowns? By serving him, by preaching and by teaching and by soul winning, by leading others to Christ, by giving a track to a certain person and saying, I, I would love for you to be my guest at church. Amen. Do whatever you can for the cause of Christ, because listen, is tomorrow guaranteed, church? Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Let's remember that we come to church, we love others, we uh, fellowship, we read our Bibles because God is so good, because he saved our souls. And listen, church, if there's something that we can leave Sunday school with to rejoice over, is that we're not going to spend eternity in hell. Listen, that, that, uh, that rich man that Jesus told the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he's still begging for a drop of water this morning. Still. Remember when Abraham had that conversation with him? And he said, Father Abraham, just, just send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue for I am, I am tormented in this flame. And listen, if there's anyone in here this morning, I don't know where we're going this route, but if there's anyone in here this morning that might have been, that might be just, Faking it. They, they, you've been coming to church and you look nice. You have a Bible, but you have not truly been born again. There might be one person in here this morning. I pray that this morning you open up your heart and you give your life to Jesus. It'd be the greatest decision that you can ever make. Amen. Let me give you B. Let me give you B here. The tabernacles. The tabernacles. While Peter's first statement was excellent, he continued to talk, and as is, as is often with Peter's case, he said too much. He, he, uh, he purposely stated that the tabernacles to be built for Moses and Elijah and for the Lord would be good. Luke described Peter as not knowing what he had said. Peter believed the occasion called for a religious ceremony of some kind. He was soon to find out something completely different. He wanted... Uh, Peter he, uh, Peter wanted Elijah and Moses and Jesus to stay there because he just wanted to be a blessing to them. He wanted to serve them all of the same degree. But I love how a cloud overshadowed them. And you notice the father said something very, very significant. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now pay attention to this part. Hear ye him. The Bible says while Peter yet spake, so what does that mean? God the Father cut Peter off. And he said, listen, Peter, I know that you're esteeming these men, these mortal men, Moses and Elijah on high during the Mount of Transfiguration. But I want you to hear my son because he's the one who's important. It, it, it has nothing to do with Moses. It has nothing to do with Elijah. God the Father said, hear my beloved son. And oftentimes where we listen to the things of the world, we listen to all kinds of voices and we're tuned into all kinds of different channels, if you will. But what we need to do is we need to shut off all the noise and we need to tune into the channel of the Holy Spirit of God. And we need to listen to God's Holy Spirit and to be sensitive to him and him alone. Amen. Let me give you the uh, number three, the father's proclamation, the father's proclamation. You're filling the blank. A central doctrine for all of Christianity is that Jesus is God. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. Jesus himself attested to being a part of the triune God when he said, I and my Father are one in John chapter 10 and verse number 30. Now the Jews, they didn't like that. The Bible says they took up stones to stone him. How can he compare himself to God the Father? That's blasphemy. Remember, they, the Bible says they rent their clothes. But listen, Jesus didn't make any mistakes when he said that. In fact, uh, he told Thomas, when you see the Father, you see me. I love what Thomas said. He said, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. For there are uh, 
it says, uh, 1 John 3.16, it says, By this we know love. Man, I, I, uh, I completely forgot that verse. 1 John 3.16, talking about how Jesus gave his life for us and that he is God. I don't know how that, that Bible verse uh, skipped my mind. If someone could pull that verse up, uh, 1 John 3.16. I know many of us memorize John 3.16. But 1 John 3.16 is a great verse for us to memorize if we're talking to a Jehovah's Witness or if we're talking to a Mormon. That's an excellent verse. Let me pull that up here for you real quick. Hereby perceive we the love of God. God because he laid down his life for us. Yes. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he, God, laid down his life for us. Thank you for that, Brother Jonathan. So who laid down his life for us? Jesus. But that verse is telling us now, that's in the King James. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. So what is that stating? That Jesus is God. Amen. Now the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses don't like that. But let me tell you, the Bible is very clear on Jesus being God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says that in John chapter number 1. Let me give you A, hear the Son, hear the Son. When Christ was baptized by John in the Jordan River, God the Father stated in an audible voice, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. On, and on the occasion of the transfiguration of Christ, all three of the gospel accounts include God stating again, This is my beloved Son, and the further command to hear ye Him, hear ye Him. With this proclamation, Peter, especially along with James and John, were brought to the realization that it was Christ and Christ alone that was God's beloved Son, in whom he was well pleased, that we should give all of our attention to Christ and to Christ alone. They were not to hear Moses, and they were not to hear Elijah at this time, and they were never to worship them. They were never to worship them. They were solely to have the reverence, and their focus solely on Jesus Christ. Solely on Jesus Christ. Let me give you B. B. They were supposed to heed the Son. H-E-E-D. Heed the Son. It is clearly understood that God wants us not just to hear Him, but also to obey Him. In Matthew 7, 24, we see Christ's definition of a wise man. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. A.W. Tozer explained it this way, It is not just trust, it is not just obey, it is to trust and obey. Amen? It is to trust and to obey. Let me give you the conclusion here. We're done. Praise the Lord. Let me give you the conclusion. These passages on the transfiguration of the Lord help us to see Christ as the God-man. And help us to realize that He is the Lord above all. He alone is worthy of our reference, of our reverence. He alone is worthy of our praise. The story also helps us to understand that we must choose not only to hear God, but also to obey Him. The writer of Hebrews said that we ought to serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. That's written in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. The Bible says this to close. Psalm 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints, and he had been in the reverence of all of them that fear him. And the reverence of all of them that fear him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for being faithful to Sunday school this morning. Uh, we'll have Brother Dan come up and take the prayer requests.